Good afternoon, Chapter 8, Lecture A. Uh, we're going to get into, whoops, things are falling. Things are just falling around here. Okay. Uh, we're going to get into Chapter 8 today, uh, Securing the Republic in the early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s, um, basically post-constitutional uh, stuff. So, a couple of the driving questions, if you're following along in Chapter 8 PowerPoint, what issues made the politics of the 1790s sort of de decisive? How did competing views of freedom and global uh, events promote the political divisions of the 1790s? What were the achievements and failures of Jeff Jefferson's presidency, and what were the causes and the significant results of the War of 1812? So, we're going to cover about 20 to 30 uh, years in this uh, chapter. So, introduction. Uh, the preservation of the sacred life of liberty and the destination of a Republican model of government, Washington proclaimed, depended on the success of the American experience in self-government. Political parties, expansion, turmoil, and war, war would come to the nation's early formative years um, and really be um, big items. Now, understand, um, we really uh, are at a very young and almost baby-like uh, statue for the country in the 1790s. We usher in the new government, so the articles had failed to some degree. And we're going to look now at how our country moved past those formative years and really put their own stamp on things. Now, politics in the age of pa passion. Hamilton's program. Uh, first divisions in the country, though you could argue the first divisions were over the Constitution, uh, Secretary of Treasury uh, Alexander Hamilton um, is going to have five parts to his economic plan. Um, as the Constitution comes in, they realize they need to do some new uh, things economically. Hamilton comes up with this plan, and it's very decisive. A lot of people don't like it. First is established a new nation's credit worthiness. They took on all the state's debt. So basically the government, the federal government will assume all the debt of the state so the state starts uh, uh, free of debt. Two, call for the creation of a new national debt. So that's kind of combining one and two together. Lower bonds, which would have uh, a stake in the country, so they could economic uh, promotion there. Creation of the Bank of the United States to handle all the money of the United States. Uh, tax on whiskey, so they could raise more revenue. And then an imposition on tariffs to promote the development of factories in the United States. Basically, we tax foreign goods, so we promote American made. Not that different than what some of the things we're doing today now. Some of this, argue we could argue about the effectiveness and everything over it. Uh, but these five points uh, were very, very decisive. Now, the emergence of opposition. So we're looking at the age of passion too. Hamilton, so Hamilton's vision of a powerful commercial republic did not make all happy. Trade of the British, heaven forbid. So Hamilton was a realist. He's like, hey, we got to trade of the British, the most important economic power in the world. We need to trade with the number one economic power. Jefferson and Madison uh, likes believed the country's future was in westward expansion. So Hamilton looked to the old world. Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists and what would become the Jeffersonian Republicans looked to the west, expanding the frontier. Yeoman farmers working the land. Now, both are right in how they view things. Now, they, they would not agree to that at the time. Hamilton was right. We need to be tied into economics of the world. At this time, the economics of the world was Europe. Jefferson and Madison are right. We need to look to the West, the frontiers. There is, there's future there. Uh, but Madison was fearful of a strong sister government allied of powerful capitalists. He's not wrong there. But it also the fears were somewhat irrational, thinking that they would be like the British and all the monies and everything would be tied up with the government. Now, the irony of all this is they did not envision uh, lobbyists and other groups and um, career politicians and the, the go list goes on. So some of the fears they had have come to fruition today, but not in the ways that they would have foreseen in the 1790s. Jefferson believes Hamilton's system was flawed and would hurt American liberty and produce corruption, though he's not wrong there. He just didn't, he wanted to keep America more rural, smaller, focused, uh, though inevitably that would not be sustainable. Poorer farmers would be hurt by it as well, he believed. Now, he's not wrong, but understand uh, the farmers need the places to trade. They need uh, economic systems to promote, like, both systems has its flaws, and really, and well, this is what kind of what we get later on is we, we mix the two. Uh, but at this early stages, mixing the two is kind of on heaven forbid. Politics of passion three, or age of passion three. The Jefferson Hamilton bargain. Now, 
Jefferson and Hamilton being some of the original founders and very important early people of this country, do strike a bargain. In an age of where there's no compromises achieved, uh, compromise was achieved multiple times in the early creation of this country. The first opposition Hamilton program came from the South. The South was dead set against the program altogether. Some like Jefferson believed the Bank of the United States was illegal. It will become with McCulloch versus Merrill, uh, McCulloch versus uh, Maryland, yeah, would uh, establish that it was legal. But opposition in Congress threatened the enactment of the plan. 1790 dinner. It is believed Jefferson brokered agreement that Southerners would accept the plan if the establishment of the permanent capital was on the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia. There's a lot of debate about this agreement at this dinner party. But all purposes, there is a lot of truth to it. We can't necessarily pinpoint this, what this said, what he said, exactly agreed upon. But it's generally viewed that Hamilton and Jefferson agreed that this capital be, at this point, further south. Now, we know Washington, D.C. is not the south as we would think of it today. But in those times, in colonial times, definitely so. Uh, this is where we get the creation of a separate city out of any state, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. And it's in Virginia. So this time, the most one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful southern state besides the Carolinas, is Virginia. Thus, um, though it's not in a state, it's right next to Maryland and Virginia, and it works itself out. Though I'll hire Major Pierre Charles Lafont to design the capital after European cities, uh, the city, ironically enough, was mostly built by slaves. So uh, though we are talking about freedom, democracy, republic, and all this, it is built heavily uh, by slaves. Not entirely, but a lot of slave labor we used. Now, the French Revolution. Slide number four here on the age of passion. As America is uh, being formed and created in our new system in the Constitution, war breaks out in France. At first, most Americans supported the French Revolution. Yay, revolution! We will support them since they support us, uh, supported us in our revolution. Uh, but the reality was the French Revolution was far, far different than the American. For one, in 1793, the revolution became very violent with the execution of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, his wife. Uh, I've actually been to the village that King Louis and his wife were apprehended in. It's on the French countryside. You'd, if you didn't know it was there, you'd kind of breeze past it. Uh, very quaint little town. Uh, but what makes it even more dramatic is that they were trying to flee to her relatives, uh, I believe in Prussia or Austria, somewhere out there, and um, they were apprehended and publicly executed. Now, the thing about the French Revolution, it wasn't just like, oh, taxes and all this. It was a generations of poverty, generations of the, the aristocrats beating down the common people, you know, the eating cake, as they always talked about. Uh, but it becomes very, very violent. And the, a lot of Americans, including Washington, wanted to keep America neutral and out of this. So Mike Jefferson cheered the revolution. Signs of liberty appeared in American towns. Washington and others believed it promoted anarchy. And really, for a period, France is in a period of anarchy. Americans' permanent alliance of France complicated the situation, and the British began to capture American ships to take sailors. So as the wars in Europe escalate and the British are dragged into it, they start impressing Americans into forced British service. And you're going to have um, Americans that are inherently look British, and they're not. And plus the British aren't going to care. It's you have Americans being forced in the British service. Uh, J Jay's Treaty passed. Uh, British uh, uh, Jay's Treaty will be passed. British promised to fully abandon Western forts in the U.S. would favor British goods. So Jay's Treaty will come along trying to smooth over the relations with the British. This led directly to a rise in the opposition party, and um, you're going to see more divisions come here that they're going to either going to support working with the British or not support working with the British, um, which is going to lead to the formation, uh, really, and you're going to slide five, the first political parties. Federalists and Republicans, Federalists were those with the support of the Constitution. Washington is often labeled a Federalist, but I would argue he is not any political party because he did not like political parties. He, uh, the Federalists will support Washington and the Constitution in favor more of the elites. They're the ones that want to control the commoners. A lot of the, the, the founders were Federalists and so on. The Republicans, or we'll call them the Jeffersonian Republicans, not the same as they were led by Jefferson, favored more rural, less ties of the British, more smaller government, uh, Nothing like neither Federalists or Republicans exist in their modern and incarn incarnation at all with the two parties today. Then you have the Whiskey Rebellion. Remember, we talked about that tax, it'll get passed. Rebellion broke out in the back country of Pennsylvania over the taxes. Washington ordered the militia and commanded the troops halfway. The rebellion quickly ended.
the point of this was people obviously don't like taxes and they were like this is unfair but yet it was enacted by representatives and stuff uh washington ride out there and by washington riding halfway with the troops and commanding the troops it sent a powerful message and people will respect that and the rebellion will quickly die and people will realize the federal government's power is supreme so washington's is the only commander-in-chief ever to personally ride out and command troops and only really the only one they could do it would be washington uh the republican party uh more the more faith in dem democratic self-government and sympathetic to France, led by Jefferson and Madison. Uh, support uh, came the wealthy southern planters, ordinary farmers, and artisans. So basically the southern way of life are going to support a lot of the Republicans because that, that was kind of their values, was the rural aspect. Heat exchange between uh, support um, between the two, though, uh, meaning the two parties are going to argue a lot, and it's going to be in public, and it's not going to be great. When Washington kind of keeps a, a tap on it, but when Washington leaves, uh, things will kind of escalate. And one thing about Washington is he leaves. There is there's there's questions whether and Jefferson left after the first term as Secretary of State uh, about how much Jefferson actually supported Washington and disagreed with him. Uh, Age of Passion Six. One of the most heated times in partisan warfare. More and more Americans became involved. This is actually a, a golden age, in some ways, of the early formation of our part, uh, political parties and just political thought. The number of newspapers rose as well. People were publishing information, debating it. Uh, clubs were talk like people talk about it, not necessarily clubs, but like organizations. Political fever was everywhere. Inspired by the JKM clubs in Paris, Democratic Republican societies were formed across the country, 50 in all. Meetings and toast discussion of French and American liberty. They would basically drink wine, toast, talk about all these concepts of liberty. They disbanded after the uh, Whiskey Rebellion, though, because of the threat. If you talk about the Jacobonians and what happens in France, we know that they don't end well. So though they'll rise, they'll quickly disappear because of the threat of rebellion, revolution, anarchy, etc. The Rights of Women, Mary Wolfenstein published it in England, a vindication of the rights of women, did challenge gender roles directly, but did advocate more access for women. Judith Sergeant Murray wrote an essay under the pen name The Gleaner, arguing the equality of the sexes and opportunity for women exercise of all their talents like men. Rights of women will be challenged, but ultimately women, you're still going to be stuck in your same world. So the 1790s comes and goes, and we'll, we'll talk more tomorrow about the 1790s towards the end with the Adams presidency. But the early years is really a formative years. We're kind of figuring out what the direction this country is going to be under the leadership of Washington and then transferring over to uh, the second generation, you want to call about it. Um, and so the 1790s is very, very, very fascinating. Have a great day.